സ്തോത്രനം പരിശുദ്ധ ഭാഗ്യം സ്തുതി ആദ്യമേ ഉന്നയിക്കും തന്നെ ആമീൻ പരിശുദ്ധനായ ദൈവമേ സ്വർഗസ്ഥ പിതാവെ ഒരു പുതിയ പ്രഭാതം ഈ ബ്രാൻഡ് ന്യൂ ഡേ കാണുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളുടെ കണ്ണുകളെ തുറന്ന ദൈവത്തിനായി സ്തുതി ഞങ്ങൾ പുതിയ പുതിയ കാര്യങ്ങൾ വീണ്ടും കാണുവാനാണ് ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് കേൾക്കുവാനാണ് ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് ഇന്ന് ഞങ്ങളോട് സംസാരിക്കുന്ന ബഹുമാനരായ ഡോക്ടേഴ്സ് ആ കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഞങ്ങളോട് കമ്മ്യൂണിക്കേറ്റ് ചെയ്യുകയും ഞങ്ങൾ ഇരിക്കുന്നതിന് മുഴുവൻ അത് മനസ്സിലാക്കി ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഹോസ്പിറ്റലിലും മറ്റുള്ളവർക്കും അത് അനുഗ്രഹമാക്കി തീർക്കുവാൻ ഞങ്ങളെ സഹായിക്കണമേ ആദ്യന്തം ഈ മീറ്റിങ്ങിനോട് കൂടെ ഇരിക്കണമേ പ്രാർത്ഥന കിട്ടുന്നതിനായി സ്തോത്രം യേശു ക്രിസ്തുവിൻ്റെ വലിയൊരു നാമത്തിൽ തന്നെ ആമേ പ്ലീസ് പ്ലീസ് ഇറ്റ് Quest is a quest into knowledge. Quest is a quest into experiences. Quest is on multidisciplinary efforts. And a quest is looking deep into our hearts, into our lives. And there can be no better presentation than what is there today. Those who haven't come today will really miss something exciting. I got a preview into it. That's what I want to say. So thank you all for coming and over to this wonderful man. Where is he? He's disappeared. <laughs> Thank you. Presenting to you, Dr. the one and only Dr. John Valier. Thank you, Dr. Jar Chandi. I'm the least of them. You may be wondering why this title, The Body of Believers, because we are all members of the Body of Believers. Let me bring your attention to this passage from 1 Corinthians 12. The body is not made up of one part, but many. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. There should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. suffers with it if one part is honored every part rejoices with it i brought in this passage to emphasize the fact that we are parts we are members we are organs of the body of believers medical college hospital and if one part suffers if one of us suffer all of us suffer and if one part is honored everybody should rejoice and be honored and you may be wondering uh, what is the qualification of a pediatric cardiac surgeon uh, to talk about the coming topic which is about the esophagus we are going to present our experience with uh, foreign body perforation of the esophagus in the adult we have a separate experience in pediatrics but we'll keep it for another day and uh, you may be asking me what do i have to do with the esophagus to tell you the truth at one time in my life i thought i was going to be an esophageal surgeon i thought i was going to take that up as a career i learned uh, esophageal surgery from pioneers of esophagus like uh, john lee collis Collis is a gastroplasty fame. Donald Belsey, Belsey Mark 1, 2, 3, and 4, hiatus hernia repair. And uh, Hugo Matthews, Hugo Matthews, who was a um, senior registrar to Belsey, and he established the first esophageal lab in the UK. And I was with him at that time. And he is the one who started radiation before surgery for esophageal cancer. Now our topic today is foreign body perforation of the esophagus and uh, my colleagues will be presenting to you a few cases which we have dealt with here as uh, as a team not only cardiothoracic but also gastro intensive care and a lot of other departments involved in it um as you can see in this um CT picture you can see medial sternal air around the esophagus so that's a telltale sign of esophageal perforation and a lot of times this is missed and we have a patients being referred to us with this CT picture but uh, not diagnosed as esophageal rupture so 
Um, the foreign body perforation of the esophagus is rare, so institutional experience is small for many institutions. And, um, uh, but uh, we have had um, the opportunity to deal with three or four cases in the last uh, year. Um, the results of surgical treatment of uh, this condition is dismal uniformly. It depends on where, when you operate on it. Um, it uh, the mortality varies between 20 and 80 percent. So the management of uh, this condition requires a new thought process and uh, innovation in management. And we have been uh, fortunate enough to hit upon a new modality which is very elegant and effective. And we have been able to accomplish it in our three cases which are going to be presented here without mortality so far. So I have great pleasure in inviting my colleague, uh, Dr. Benson. He's not only our anesthesiologist, he's our physician, he's, our, he's the brain of the unit, and uh, he keeps us uh, in line, and he does uh, not only does the anesthesia and intensive care, but he's our ultrasonographer, and uh, he doesn't accept anything less than 100% anything less than perfect from us. And Dr. Benson will be presenting a few cases before you. Dr. Benson. Thank you, sir. That was too much of a description for me. <laughs> Uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you, sir, for that elaborate description. I am not worthy for all those uh, praises. Uh, uh, like our department has been dealing with uh, foreign body impaction leading to esophageal perforation since probably 2019. We have encountered around four cases. Four cases in which three were adults. One was a pediatric five-year-old boy who actually came with a battery ingestion leading to aortic like it uh, eroded into iota. So that's, uh, uh, John Sir actually managed that case and that patient was done quite well. Other three were adult patients who ingested uh, fish bone and one was with a chicken bone. So I'd like to present two of them, uh, uh, who uh, two of these cases, uh, how they presented to us and how we managed them. So coming on to the first case, uh, it was a 64 year old male he actually presented to us in March 2019 with history of progressive neck swelling and breathlessness since one week. So th there was no, actually, the, neither the family members nor this patient uh, did give any history of any ingestion of any, uh, any food that, that could have caused a perforation like that. 
uh, and this person actually when he came itself he was so so much breathless that we had to uh, he present with strider and there was a, a practically no airway so we had to actually intubate him early uh, so that's why a proper history taking was a difficult because the wife was unaware of what the patient had eaten or so we were actually in the dark so he presented with the gross neck swelling fever and obstructed breathing and was uh, intubated and uh, a CCT thorax was done, which showed media stenitis with a right pleural collection. And uh, a contrast, oral contrast was given, which didn't show any leak. So this was the presenting uh, CT. You can see uh, the collection uh, on the right side, and then there is a collection on the media stain also. So we did a right thoracotomy, and we drained out around 350 ml of pus. But uh, the patient still uh, uh, continued uh, being feverish. So we did a repeat seat, uh, CCT and with a neck, which showed a retropharyngeal abscess from C2 to C5 region. So we can see here uh, air, uh, air pockets here, and uh, swelling uh, over the soft tissue. And there was a recurrence of the medial standal and right MPMI again. So then we involved uh, our maxillofacial surgeon, Dr. Bichu. Uh, he did a neck exploration along with our team, and uh, we did a drainage of the para-retropharyngeal spaces and a re-exploration of the right uh, right uh, thorax, and we again drained the media stain. Still, this patient persisted to have fever and counts, so we were actually uh, in the dark like what could be the cause, because all the pus, all the collections was all drained. Still, the patient was not improving. So ultimately, we uh, went, uh, planned for an upper GI endoscopy, and because of the gross edema, uh, only a small scope could be introduced. And uh, a small scope was introduced, and uh, uh, it was seen that esophageal, there were two perforations around 30 centimeters down uh, that were directly opposite to each other. And uh, in the same setting itself, endoscopic clips were applied, and the mucosa was sealed. So because of still persisting collection, we again had to reopen the patient and uh, uh, drain out the thorax for the third time. After which, a uh, feeding jejunostomy was also done in that setting. So this, uh, we don't have, sorry, we don't have the images, but here you can see the perforations. This is the uh, endoscopy report. You can see the perforations in the 30 centimeter down the esophages. So this is the um, CT after the procedures, after we had done all these, you can see that the all the uh, thorax has been cleared out, mediastinum is clear, and here you can see uh, uh, oral contrast uh, in the esophagus, and here are the clips. So we didn't have, we did a uh, post-op uh, oral contrast check to check for any further leak, which was negative, and the patient improved and subsequently went home. This is the second case, which uh, uh, came recently. This was a 78-year-old male who was edentulous, and he had food at home, and uh, this time, actually, we had a proper history that patient had taken, eaten f uh, chicken, and following which he had an accidental swallowing of a chicken bone and impaction the lower esophagus. That was diagnosed in a local hospital. So the, uh, the local hospital, the, the surgeon over there was like, actually, he did a, he attempted an endoscopic retrieval. But uh, because of bleeding, it had to be aborted. And so the foreign body was actually pushed to the stomach. Uh, and uh, the patient was discharged, uh, according to the history which we obtained. But four days later, this patient presented back to the hospital with upper abdominal pain. And then uh, he was diagnosed as a strangulated epigastric umbilical hernia at a local hospital, and they did a repair of this hernia. But his breathlessness increased, and the next day he had chest pain, was desaturating, and ultimately he was referred to us. And uh, the x-ray taken over there showed a right pleural effusion. So he reached us around on the 10th day. So this was the presenting x-ray. You can see that uh, there's a collection of the pleural effusion on the right side. And this is the CT scan. So this is the right thorax. You can see all these collections here. This is the uh, empyema there. And you have a, a broadened media stain also. There is some air pockets here. There's a video of the CT. This is a sagittal view. This is a spine, and this is the the, the collection in the right uh, pleura. So as we go down, the esophagus slowly comes up here, 
and then as we go down we can see a small foreign body that was actually a chicken bone here this white thing there's a chicken bone impacted there at the T9 T10 level uh, which was diagnosed on the uh, CT so in the, in the first instance patient was sick so a right uh, ICD was inserted and the, uh, the collection was drained then we did an oral contrast to actually find out the level of the leak so it was found to be a T8, TN, T8 to T9 level uh, which was suggested of perforation then we got gastroenterology involved uh, who, where an urgent upper GI endoscopy was done and it was confirmed to have two large perforations opposite one of the esophagus with foreign body impaction. So on day three, a foreign body retrieval was done. Uh, Dr. Ronnie will go through the details about that in the next uh, presentation. Uh, a nasocastric tube was inserted and the perforation was clipped. On day four, we took up the patient for a thoracotomy and drained of the empyema. And uh, we also inspected the esophageal region during the thoracotomy to confirm for further leaks. So this is the post-surgical uh, post uh, CT. So here you can see that all the pus has been drained off from the right side. It's clearing off. And uh, this is the uh, oral contrast of esophagus where you can see there's no leak and there are clips. These are the clips which have been applied at that level. So the patient was extubated on the post-operative day of the second post-operative day and he improved and was discharged home. So I come to the end of my presentation. I hand over it to uh, Dr. John to... Thank you. Benson, um, the first case was our teacher, actually. The first case which came um, very... Uh, about two, three weeks after his uh, injury. And uh, we had no history of, um, he was supposed to be fasting and not taking meat or fish. And his wife said, it's maybe a drumstick <laughs> caused the injury. But anyway, they find, later we found out that he had um, alcohol in the uh, rubber thought of this, uh, with uh, ketamine also. Um, because uh, of uh, our experience, um, uniform dismal experience, with surgical results, uh, with the help of Dr. Roni, we did in the first case had a, an esophagoscopy and we found uh, two tears. And uh, I asked um, uh, Dr. Roni if he can clip it. We didn't have clips at that time. We had to get it from Kochi. So he did the repeat uh, uh, scopy the next day and uh, managed to clip both sides. And then we were able to manage with minimal surgery. And uh, the next case also was similarly treated. We have a third case in the ICU now, which has been similarly treated, and the patient is still here, not discharged yet. That is why Dr. Benson did not present that case. But he's doing fairly well. Uh, I invite uh, Dr. Roni now to present um, his um, pictures and videos of the procedure, which is quite novel, endoscopic clipping of esophageal perforation, followed by surgical clearance.
India will never be able to do. Partly because there is no teamwork. Partly this is an idea that cardiothoracic team got. And we happen to have a brilliant endoscopist in Ronnie. You know, he's as smart as he looks in his uh, Chinese shirt and all that. <laughs> So you can see them struggling to make sure that you that we all see the images, but uh, throughout this whole process it was even much much tougher. And I got a peek into all this because Dr. John and I worked together in the same from the same office. So patient very sick, this that and the other. Chesnath Murudan Pasan and Dhanachi and the Denda, Evidna where did that come from? So there are many aspects of work in this. One is making the right diagnosis. And that's why Dr. John introduced Benson as the thinker and the physician amongst them. Then you'll soon hear the surgeon speaking. And then Dr. Sutra Dharagan and Adhyam Prasenti, the Dr. John. Then, of course, he presented about the unity, about different departments working together. So, and this I'm telling you because I heard it firsthand. Uh, my Ronnie was uh, a bit hesitant. I think in Adivati Chayanadana, and maybe even the first time in India. So, Chayanukumo, uh, Ingenia. Actually, Dr. John said, Ronnie, you go ahead and do it. I take care of the problem. So, it's very important to have surgeons who will stand by physicians and uh, operators to make sure that. So, one, once more, big hand to. Dr. John Benson and Tom. Thank you, Dr. George Chandy. Oh, shit. Um, I must say that uh, you must uh, have a, a state of mind to listen to other. When was it ingested? That's very important. A foreign body which is ingested just a few hours, it's pretty easy to remove. The more the time it takes, there'll be a lot of edema, swelling, infections, etc., etc. It becomes more difficult to retrieve the foreign body. And definitely any complications like mediastinal perforation, etc., it makes the procedure more difficult. So we basically get calls from the ER, from the pediatric team, from the ENT. But whenever we get the call from the cardiothoracic team, we know it's a difficult and probably a challenging case which we'll be confronting. So I'll be basically uh, uh, going through the, uh, the uh, patient for the second case, what uh, Dr. Benson uh, described. So this was our initial experience when we did endoscopy. So in 2019, this was our experience because we don't know what to do, where to go, what accessory to put in, and uh, this was our feeling when we did our first uh, perforation uh, management. 
So this is the second case. This is a chicken bone injection who came to us I think day 10, day 11. And you can see the foreign body here. Um, what you see here is basically, there's basically a two-site impaction here. Uh, one at this level and one at this level. So before entering, we do not know what type of fish bone, uh, what type of bone it is. Uh, so when we went down, what we saw there's a third side perforation. You can see it's something a Y-shaped uh, bone. It is impacted here, it's impacted here, and it's impacted here. So basically, there are three sites of impaction here. So this is how it looks uh, uh, schematically. You can see it's a Y-shaped. It's the wishbone. I think wishbone is supposed to be a lucky bone, and probably it turned really unlucky for this uh, person. Uh, so it's a Y-shaped with three pointed edges. So this is how it uh, looked on and impacted. Because it's tightly impacted, it's staying there for past, can we disimpact? And we should cause minimal trauma while disimpacting. So sometimes when you try to remove it, it'll cause more trauma, the perforation will increase. So luckily, we were able to disimpact it without much uh, injury. And uh, since it was on the lower esophagus, we pushed it into the stomach. So at least in the stomach, we have more space to maneuver it. And you can see this is the uh, chicken bone which was impacted in the esophagus. Now next step is how to retrieve it. So uh, this is basically the stomach. We pushed the foreign body into the stomach. And this is basically the fundus. The fun always the fundus is the most dependent portion uh, when the patient is lying so pain. We did the procedure in the ICU with the help of our critical care uh, team. So we had a good sedation. Patient was comfortable. And then we uh, did the procedure. See, one more thing. Uh, a foreign body which has been there for past 10 days. Another problem is when we hold it, it may just break. It may be very brittle. So sometimes it has happened when we take it, we only be able to remove only half part. Some part will be remaining still into the wall. So that was another concern we had. Uh, now the issue is it has three pointed edges. Now how do you remove it safely? Because you can see it's in three different directions. If it's just a single linear bone, it's easy to pull out. There will not be injury. But you can see it, since it's three different directions, you pull out with one edge, the other two edge will go and uh, pierce or tear the esophagus. So we use something called a latex hood protector. We uh, place this at the tip of the endoscope and try to uh, bring the foreign body as much close to the scope. You can see that uh, rubber like material there. Sometimes it may slip because uh, it's very slippery. Our forceps are, has a grip, but it may not hold sometimes too. So we are pulling it out. And uh, luckily it came out without much uh, resistance. Okay, we removed it. And the next step is assessment of injury. First of all, what is the present injury? And have we made any iatrogenic injury? Those are two things we have to assess. So we are going back again. And now you can probably start seeing, see, uh, this is a large tear on the left side. You can see it's a huge tear here. And there is a big hole. I, I think you can appreciate this hole. So that's a perforation in the distal end. And there's another perforation on the proximal end of the tear. And simultaneously opposite also there was another tear. So basically we had a large tear on the left side. You can see the hole and you can see all the pus and the debris coming out. So the moment the foreign body was removed, so everything was exuding out through those perforation sites. So we had a large tear on the left side. You can see all the pus and blood and uh, debris coming out. There's a large hole here. There's a hole this in the uh, proximal side. And, uh, and there's another one here. So basically we had two tears, three perforation sites. So now 
how do we go forward? What do we do? Because we never expressed such a large tear. We thought it would be a small tear, like the previous patient we had. It was a small perforation. We could just go and use the special clips. But this was a very large tear. So the, the, large tear, the large perforation can be very well visible here. Yes, yes. So all the, uh, the pus what is there and the media stem is coming out. So we decided to put uh, for the large tear, we thought of using hemoclips. Hemoclips are uh, regular clips what we use for uh, stopping bleeds, ulcer bleeds, etc. Uh, Uh, those, so this is how hemoclip looks. So it's basically around 16 mm uh, diameter, and it's a bi flange uh, clip. Uh, these are all the uh, regular perforation clips. But since the tear was very large, the regular perforation clip will not hold that length. So we thought of putting multiple clips to seal off the big tear and the perforation. So this is what we did for the large tear with two perforations on the left side. So we are applying the clip, and the clip has been deployed. So there's one clip which has been deployed. That's a distal end that's near the GE junction. And we are deploying the second clip more proximal to the first clip. You can see now the tear has come opposed. It's more difficult to put the second clip because there's not much space now. And just uh, the aorta is just below this. So we are working on a very uh, critical area. OK, so, so we sealed the two tears, uh, the, uh, the larger tear with two uh, standard hemoclips. And the tear and the perforation, which is present on the right side, so we were basically, basically examining it, how large it is. Because there's a lot of edema there. And, uh, this is the tear. You can just see there's a central tear here. This region. So basically, we are assessing the tear first because the perforation clips are pretty expensive. It's around uh, 50,000 to 50, 60,000 rupees for one clip. So we have to be very sure before using it whether it will hold, whether the perforation size is correct for the clip. So we felt the uh, this, are, this is the clip what uh, Dr. Benson mentioned. This is the over the scope clip. This have uh, revolutionized the management in uh, managing perforations. So uh, this is uh, a very nice modality. This was the, uh, the first patient we used two such clips to close the perforation. So we decided to go ahead with this clipping for the other perforation. And this is it's being loaded onto the scope. You can see those uh, metallic edges. It's like something called a bare claw appearance. And we are going inside. Here's the tear. This is the tear. So we just suck onto the scope for appearing uh, for applying the clip. So we just uh, you can see the uh, tear. It's very well seen here. So we had to suck as much as possible to bring maximum mucosa into the suction cup, and then we are deploying the clip. The clip is very well deployed. You can see the large chunk of mucosa there, and the other two clips in situ. This is how it looks basically. Uh, the over the scope or the OTSC clip. So this is what we did for the patient. 
and probably we feel in the coming years oh, clipping this would be as easy and hope the technology and our expertise improves okay thank you this is our team i think uh, people who are standing are more important than people who are sitting here to make this uh, procedure a success okay thank you thank you roni you observed how elegantly and how calmly how quietly he did this it's not easy at all not as as easy as, as you see so this is made uh, the surgery much much simpler the <coughs> skill of a surgeon is not to do a huge surgery it is to do minimal surgery so roni and his colleagues helped us to do minimal surgery for these patients and uh, that is the secret of the success minimal surgery and uh, expert endoscopic clipping so i invite uh, dr kanan to present the surgical aspect of this good morning to all uh, my idea here is to uh, give a brief uh, outlook of uh, surgery in case of esophageal perforation especially in the outset of a foreign body anyway it is uh, always as uh, uh, dr john said it is a challenging issue because uh, always dial um, th there is a very difficult to get a history from a, uh, appropriate patient the first patient which uh, sir was mentioning was 64 year old male he had two wives and uh, each of them one each them has a different idea about uh, the uh, the uh, uh, about the foreign body actually one told it is uh, <laughs> drumstick and other uh, <laughs> <laughs> one told it is uh, uh, fish fish bone <laughs> anyway uh, so th from that point it is it was definitely that uh, is a challenging issue and because of uh, <laughs> what uh, we as the thoracic surgeons we are uh, really scared of this uh, media stenitis because we don't, in, even in spite of uh, all uh, high funda antibiotics we don't know how it, uh, each patient is going to behave Uh, and uh, as if now the current mortality says that around uh, 13% for uh, perforations less than 24 hours and 55% in the best of the centers uh, for perforations more than uh, 24 hours again as i told age uh, and uh, i am um, uh, as dr john told uh, that uh, young uh, the he will be presenting uh, later about the uh, story of the young boy and other other uh, the, the case which uh, dr roni has mentioned is having about 78 years so we have a wide range of uh, 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 people on uh, wide range of uh, age and basically it again matters on the general condition and uh, second is the location because uh, uh, cervical uh, perforations uh, uh, behave pretty badly whereas uh, thoracic and abdominal uh, is uh, pretty easy to manage and also uh, the intrinsic disease of uh, esophagus also esophagus also matters like motility diseases uh, strictures and all uh, several series indicate that better results with treatment as i told it is within 24 hours as compared to uh, compared to uh, after 24 hours and that golden period is first 24 hours because uh, if a patient present uh, within that time Uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, say by around 5 uh, or 10 minutes to finish off all these things as uh, roni told but uh, uh, subsequently what happens is uh, even after that uh, the the problem is the leak may persist uh, we were lucky enough to uh, just escape from all these uh, problems because all the patients presented to us with uh, at least more than 10 days and if you look at the anatomy of esophagus there are basically three narrow narrowing point are there that is one is in the cricopharyngeus uh, upper esophageal uh, uh, cricopharyngeus muscle next is in the arch of aorta or the uh, left bronchus and other is the gastroesophageal junction these these are the three narrow points where uh, these foreign body impaction can happen coming to the mediastinal anatomy uh, as you see that uh, uh, once the esophagus perforates especially if the posterior wall it can spread into the retro visceral space that is a posterior mediastinum if it is anterior it can uh, go into the pretracheal fascia and anterior to the uh, and in the anterior mediastinum so look at the if you look at the cervical uh, esophageal perforation the basic idea of a uh, uh, surgeon a thoracic surgeon is to 
uh, explore the neck and uh, primary drainage because if esophagus uh, e uh, is normal in the sense downstream is normal then this drainage itself will heal the problem and uh, these two pa the, uh, the two patients which we did uh, uh, it primarily we did was a uh, drainage itself no primary because uh, um, uh, since it was late and the tissue was uh, very bad so we couldn't find a hole there, but still we could manage with the uh, drainage and uh, mobilization. Again, coming to thoracic and uh, abdominal perforation, definitely is a surgical candidate, even if it, uh, no, I mean, the, the saying goes that no patient is too sick to be operated. So that is a traditional surgical doctrine. Uh, and uh, there is definitely a strong evidence, as if now there is a strong evidence for this non-operative approach in selected patients. And uh, we go, like, uh, from a surgical point of view, if there is a, uh, a leak in the upper or middle uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic uh, esophagus, we go via right thoracotomy. And in the lower third, uh, we go via left thoracotomy. These are the classical repair where you repair the uh, esophagus in two, uh, two different layers. And uh, if it's a, uh, very, uh, if the, if the, uh, after mobilizing the esophagus, if it is quite bad, we got to, uh, after the primary repair, we got to mobilize it with a pericardial, I mean, uh, with a uh, thoracot, um, uh, intercostal muscle flap to have a complete covering. And uh, see, as I told, I'm just elaborating on uh, patients uh, who presented with the es esophageal, uh, foreign body esophages, not the other uh, perforations like a uh, post. Uh, um, cancerous condition or uh, patient with achalasia or patient with esophageal strictures uh, who present uh, uh, for uh, esophageal dilatation and uh, end up in uh, esophageal perforation. So basically, uh, the thing is debride and drainage the mediastinal and pleural spaces, control of esophageal leak, re-expansion of lung, prevent, uh, prevention of gastric reflux, nutrition and ventilatory support, appropriate antibiotics and post-operative localization and drainage of the residual foci. Again, there are different methods not at the outset of foreign body, but like closure with something like closure with a buttress patch, as I told you, exclusion and diversion in case of a uh, carcinoma and a T-tube fistula, which is rarely done nowadays, thoracic drainage and irrigation and other intraluminal stents and resection. This is the uh, that 78 year old patient whom uh, uh, we operated. This video is just to have, uh, give an overall picture of how the chest looks like. This is after drainage of a pus, we have opened the mediastinum and the, my, my, my suction goes around the uh, esophagus and the transverse band which we see, that is the asagus vein. And the whole, uh, the whole esophagus you got to mobilize and uh, you have to place a drain onto that uh, mediastinum to have a proper drainage and facilitate healing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kanan. <coughs> the standard management of this is um, um, esophageal stenting um, to exclude the leak and also esophageal diversion, which is to doing a cervical esophagostomy and also fe feeding gastrostomy or jejunostomy. You used to do that in the past, and I remember one case when I was in England who had a cervical esophagostomy and a gastrostomy to feed and when he swallowed saliva, it used to come through the neck and he had to be fed through the stomach. But this fellow could not taste his food. So he found a novel way. He put a rubber tube from his esophagostomy to the gastrostomy and he used to eat. <laughs> so that uh, he, could, um, he could taste his food and swallow it, it goes into the stomach. So patients are more innovative than us. This guy put a rubber tube from the esophagostomy to the gastrostomy so that he could eat. And when he finished eating, he takes the tube out. So uh, to, this is very, and later on, when the leak heals, you have to reconstruct the esophagus. Um, probably from a colon transplant, by a colon transplant. But uh, to avoid all these complex procedures, what we have done here is a simple, elegant procedure, no diversion, uh, in, in endoscopic clipping, and surgical drainage of the abscesses. Uh, along with 
the gastroenterologist puts a feeding through tube under vision into the jejunum. So there is no jejunostomy, no esophagostomy. Um, the, the tube goes into the jejunum. We can start feeding after a few days. And uh, the surgery is minimal. The extensive surgery Dr. Kannan described uh, with the intercostal muscle flap or is not necessary since the leak is already sealed by the gastroenterologist. So I think we have um, uh, hit upon a, a novel, elegant method of treating esophageal perforation. And I, my special thanks to the radiology department for helping us with, uh, with the diagnosis. And uh, they have been extremely helpful. Whenever we asked uh, for, for imaging, and um, uh, sometimes I go with the patient and um, stay uh, with the radiologist and tell them what we need. Um, and they've been extremely helpful. And the intensive care team, Philip is here. And they have looked after these uh, patients um, with uh, great expertise. And uh, that's a great part of the success of this story. So the message uh, today is that together we are stronger. And uh, we are all part of uh, a body of uh, believers. And uh, each uh, organ has to help the other. And when we do that, uh, we can uh, work one day. Thank you. I don't know whether all of you know that this team Dr. Suresh is there, Dr. John <coughs> Benson, Sajit, and Kannan. They've had 100% success in all that they have done. Can we give them a big hand? I don't think there's any, others, any other group that has done so well. They're very quiet. They don't advertise, so we don't know much about it. You don't hear a lot about the great things. But thank you so much for the excellent work, and in this particular area, in terms of innovation. And on a lighter note, I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, Ronnie showed those two pictures, the driving pictures. He's got a twin brother, okay, identical twin, who's a neurologist. Both wives allow them to do that, and that, that is his stress buster. So keep doing it, Ronnie do much more and I hope there are lots of stress busters. But I think we need to stand up and give them a great ovation, standing ovation and thank God for the excellent work that they've done. Thank you, Dr. John. Thank you. Thank you. Very proud of you. I hope this comes out as a big publication and the world will watch and learn the new way to do this. Thank you all for coming.